Paul Tillich was an influential existentialist theologian. It's an oversimplification, but he argued that the important thing is our personal relationship with God and how this influences the way we live our lives so as to enrich the lives of other people. Leafing through a book of sermons by, by Tillich, I came across a short, short address aimed at young students. It was inspired by a passage from Matthew and two other short quotes from the New Testament. The passage from Matthew, Matthew 25, 31 to 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then the short quote from the uh, first letter of John, 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love, lives in God, and God in them. A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. That last quote there from John 13, verses 34 to 35. So turning now to this uh, book of sermons by, by Tillich, uh, and this, this isn't a sermon, it's a very short address, and it was given to uh, a group of students. After 2,000 years, are we still able to realise what it means to say God is love? The writer of the first epistle of John certainly knew what he wrote, for he drew the consequences. He who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. God abiding in us, making us his dwelling place, is the same thing as our abiding in love, as our having love as the centre of our habitation. God and love are not two realities, they are one. God's being is the being of love, and God's infinite power of being is the infinite power power of love. Therefore he who professes devotion to God may abide in God if he abides in love, or he may not abide in God if he does not abide in love, and he who doesn't speak of God may abide in him if he is abiding in love. And since the manifestation of God as love is his manifestation in Jesus the Christ, Jesus can say, that many of those who don't know him belong to him, and that many of those who confess their allegiance to him do not belong to him. The criterion, the only ultimate criterion, is love. For God is love, and the divine love is triumphantly manifest in Christ the crucified. Let me tell you a story of a woman who died in 1948, and whose life was spent abiding in love, Although she rarely, if ever, used the name of God, 
and though she would have been surprised had someone told her that she belonged to him who judges all of us because he is love and love is the only criterion of his judgment. Her name was Elsa Brandstrom, the daughter of a former Swedish ambassador to Russia, but her name in the mouths of hundreds and thousands of prisoners of war during the First World War was the Angel of Siberia. She was an irrefutable living witness to the truth that love is the ultimate power of being, even in the 20th century, which belongs to the darkest, most destructive and cruel of all centuries since the dawn of mankind. At the beginning of the First World War, when Elsa Brandstrom was 24 years old, she looked out of the window of the Swedish embassy in St. Petersburg and saw the German prisoners of war being driven through the streets on their way to Siberia. From that moment, she could no longer endure the splendour of the diplomatic life of which up to then she had been a beautiful and vigorous centre. She became a nurse and she began visiting the prison camps. There she saw unspeakable horrors and she, a girl of 24, began almost alone the fight of love against cruelty. And she prevailed. She had to fight against the resistance and suspicion of the authorities and she prevailed. She had to fight against the brutality and lawlessness of the prison guards and she prevailed. She had to fight against cold, hunger, dirt, illness, against the conditions of an undeveloped country and a destructive war and she prevailed. Love gave her wisdom with innocence and daring with foresight and whenever she appeared despair was conquered and sorrow healed. She visited the hungry and gave them food. She saw the thirsty and gave them drink. She welcomed the strangers, clothed the naked, strengthened the sick. She herself fell ill and was imprisoned, but God was abiding in her. The irresistible power of love was with her. And she never ceased to be driven by this power. After the war, she initiated a great work for the orphans of German and Russian prisoners of war. The sight of her among these children, whose sole ever shining son she was, must have been a decisive religious impression for many people. With the coming of the Nazis, she and her husband were forced to leave Germany and come to America. Here she became the helper of innumerable European refugees. And for 10 years, I was able personally to observe the creative genius of her love. We never had a theological conversation. It was unnecessary. She made God transparent in every moment. For God, who is love, was abiding in her and she in him. She aroused the love of millions towards herself and towards that for which she was transparent. The God who is love. On her deathbed, she received a delegate from the king and people of Sweden, representing innumerable people all over Europe, assuring her that she would never be forgotten by those to whom she'd given back the meaning of their lives. It's a rare gift to meet a human being in whom love, and, and this means God, is so overwhelmingly manifest. It undercuts theological arrogance, as well as pious isolation. It's more than justice, and it's greater than faith and hope. It is the presence of God himself, for God is love. And in every moment of genuine love, we are dwelling in God and God in us.